audience out there. Um, welcome to the 2020 series. My name is Liz Hinline. I am the creative director and filmmaker at New York Film Academy. And I am so thrilled today to present Adam Bernstein, brilliant, brilliant director and other brilliant director, Sarah Prozac. And we are gonna be talking about craft for about 20 minutes. So you'll get to hear us banter back and forth and get some inside you know, ideas, stories, thoughts on directing, TV directing, working with the rock stars, working with famous people, and working long hours. Um, and then we will have 20 minutes of uh, questions by you guys. And I'm so sorry to say, I won't be able to, we won't be able to answer everything, but um, give it a shot, write in your questions. We'd love to hear what you're thinking and, you know, get into the brains of these creative visionaries. Um, so a little bit of background is that, um, Sarah and Adam have known each other from back in the day when we all were, you know, little pups doing music videos. And even more background, they both did very seminal uh, projects with the Beastie Boys. Amazing. Um, so my question for you guys is, now that you're like, you know, high gung-ho uh, narrative filmmakers, what did you learn from your era of music video directing? Oh, good question, Sarah. Do you want to go first? Oh gosh, well, um, we probably learned a lot of the same things. How to make a penny stretch, how to make a long day even longer and get the shots and the coverage you need that takes you into, you know, where you are now. But um, I don't know. I mean, what did I learn? I had the access as a young filmmaker, as you probably did too, to shooting formats and, um, you know, different using different equipment that we wouldn't have necessarily had, you know, uh, what's we call it access to. So, you know, we were doing bleach bypass on reversal film, we were doing 16 millimeter, we were shooting Bolex mixed with um, beta, I don't know, stuff like that, that was really interesting. And being able to mix mediums and feel free in what we were doing. I mean, that's just the beginning. I mean, you have so much to add. But yeah, we were all we were so gorilla, weren't we? Uh, yeah, I think I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, I think what, I, what was great about the music video business, you know, I started doing it in 86, is that it was very unstructured. And it was, uh, there would be a commissioner at the record companies and the commissioner's job was to hand out the videos. But often you were just had to write like a couple paragraphs of a treatment when you were sort of auditioning for the job, or if they knew they wanted you, you know, then then you would sort of talk to the band and cook up an idea together. But I guess there's a long-winded way of saying that there wasn't, there weren't all the layers of approval and there weren't a lot of executives that were sort of, you know, you didn't have to negotiate a lot, a lot of barriers towards what you could, also because the budgets were generally kind of low. But I think what's, um, what I found, you know, useful about doing the video it was just it was like a laboratory for trying out different techniques and gadgets and lenses it was like oh we want to do a video that's got a lot of macro shots in it or i want to use a split diopter or a crane or like i want to like under crank the camera or over crank the camera so it was it was a little bit of a fun uh laboratory where you could try out different techniques and mm -hmm. uh and also like the there is very little kind of like downside in terms of risk of failure because it wasn't like you couldn't cut a scene. It was a music video. Right. No one knew what it was supposed to be in the first place. No. Did you feel that you guys found your voice? Like, especially Adam, you did like a lot of music videos at, at, in that day. Did you, did you like try out different genres and different things to see like, oh, I'm really good. You know, action is my thing. Or, you know, I really like moving that camera around or I like doing the, you know, the dramatic storytelling. I think, I mean, it's, it, you know, the genre thing for me, it came more into play when the band was interested in a certain kind of movie. Like uh, you do a video for the Dead Milkman and they're like, we really want this to look like a Dario Argento movie. And so you'd watch <laughs> a bunch of those and then like do a video in that style. Yeah, and it, it was less like it pointed me towards a genre. It was just kind of a fun way to kind of mimic some other genres. And I just remembered, 
I just have to say one thing, Liz. I just remembered. Did I art direct your dead milkman video um, with the nurses in the for big time operator? Yes. That one, yeah. I was the art director on that. I was trying to remember who the director was. That's so crazy. <laughs> That's, That's so fun. Fabulous. That's right. That is, that is so fabulous. So how did you, because how did you pivot from say music videos, indie film into TV? What was that trajectory, Adam? Um, well, for me, it's like I did the videos for about maybe like seven years or so. And I got more and more interested in doing narrative filmmaking. Um, and I worked for a little bit I had, I had worked earlier in my career before I did the videos, I worked at Nickelodeon and they sort of, at one point, they got into the kind of half hour genre. They made a show called The Adventures of Pete and Pete, uh, which was created by two writers from the promo department at Nickelodeon, Will McRobb and Chris Viscardi. And they sort of just hired music video directors to direct on the show. So there was no barrier to entry in that way, you know, I mean, right. it, was, it was all very indie, off the radar. So um, I guess I sort of cut my teeth a little bit on that. And that was more on the comedy side. And at the same time, I did a short film that was about 20 minutes long. That was like a little bit Roman Polanski inspired. And then that, um, there an executive at Fox TV named Stephen Chow, who started America's Most Wanted. He saw that short. And then he hired me to do crime reenactments, which I did for about a year, which were like the most, it was probably the most fun job I ever had, except you can't show them to anyone. So that was sort of like my first entry into narrative filmmaking were those two activities or TV into narrative television. And, and Sarah, you pivoted from music videos like, like I did into commercials and then also right. did narrative. And from, you did a lot of promos as I recall. Right. I mean, Adam and I come from that whole era of um, MTV and mm -hmm. that world where you could make little promo pieces and then cut them into something else. I ended up doing uh, music videos and then going, how can I, because I was doing a lot of hip hop music videos mm -hmm. and, you know, it was back then being a white woman doing hip hop videos was kind of weird and interesting. Um, so it was hard door to knock on in a way, even though I love rap, which was called band kids. Um, but, uh, doing that work took me into going into, uh, commercials because that was the door I could knock on, you know, mm. and someone actually way back when I met, um, some people from Uptown Records, they were like, girl, get into commercials. That's where they want you. So I cut down some of my music videos into spec commercials and made a spec reel mm -hmm. and then transitioned that way. And I was really interested in narrative also and storytelling, which music videos were great for because you could do all those vignette things. You could do improv with actors. Like you might hire them the day before and just go, hey, you're having a fight on the street or whatever. And some of them were incredible actors who could just pull it out. And that was really exciting. But um, so that was a whole different uh, row to hoe, as they say. Um, so I, uh, I ended up going to commercials and starting my own little company by funding it through doing commercials. And one in my first, first iteration as a commercial director, a big campaign for Bell South Telephone, which was amazing for me at the time because I needed the dough and needed to get on and it helped me fund my little company to start. And that's where I met Sarah is when she had her little company and um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the whole, that whole New York scene at the time where everybody sort of knew everybody and DPs and editors, we all traded them. So, um, and you know, Sarah and I are both pivoting into TV and, and my question for you, Adam, is you've been so prolific. You've done the coolest shows on the friggin' planet, every show that I would die to work on. Did you... <laughs> but you've done different genres, so you're genre agnostic. So how how did that work that you were able to go from 30 Rock to um, United States of Terra to Breaking Bad? I think, you know, that was kind of like a lucky fluke of how I started getting into it. Because there's this tendency, there's this, you know, you know, in the episodic directing world or the pilot directing world, there's often there's either a network and a studio involved or just a network, 
you know, depending on the situation. And they keep lists of directors and the lists are broken down by like comedy directors and drama directors. And then and Adam. I, and then Adam. <laughs> and then Adam. In your own fault. I somehow got onto both lists. But I think I got onto both lists by a fluke, really, because I had I had done this like short kind of thrillery piece and then done crime reenactments and then I had done like a um an indie movie that was like a crime thriller and that got me um Dean Winters and Alexa Fogel who worked for Tom Fontana sort of saw that movie and recommended me to him and I got to work for him you know for a number of years and you know because he's such a highly placed um drama showrunner that kind of gave me this kind of good housekeeping seal of approval because I was working for him. And at the same time, I had done this show, The Adventures of Pete and Pete, which someone at Comedy Central liked it. And then they hired me to do this pilot that Amy Sedaris was in called Strangers with a Candy. So, you know, which was a really weird, funny pilot. And then that got me more comedy work. So it was really, I just kind of got lucky because I think most, I don't know if all, but a lot of directors can work in both genres. And sometimes it's just a, like if a director comes up doing comedy shows, all of a sudden they'll just get considered for comedies, even though their interest might be more in dramas. They just get stuck on the list. And, and there's a lot of institutional resistance between letting people go back and forth or off one list onto another list, unless someone really advocates them. But I just sort of, I had this kind of you know, divided activities from the from the beginning. So it sort of, it, it helped me get on considered for both things. And, you know, and I also thought, you know, the dramas I like when I, when I was doing, you know, when I do dramas, it's sort of like, I love stuff that's got a little humor in it. And then when you do comedies, I like them when they're dark. So it's kind of like there's a little bit of a, if you draw the Venn diagram, there is a little bit of overlap in sensibility between those things. Mm -hmm. That's amazing because you're just so visual as well because you do Fargo and then you do 30 Rock and it just is a very and you did the pilots for both and so um do you is there a different prep that you do when you're doing comedy as opposed to you know heavy you know dark drama? I don't you know I, th I sort of approach both things the same way in terms of like what you're doing in pre-production. I just think that um I think when you're doing drama, it's a little bit more like a movie or the director's role. If you're doing a drama pilot, it's a little bit more like doing a movie because you're sort of, you're partnered with the writer and your purview is a little bit more like a movie director. Whereas comedy is like super collaborative. I mean, comedy's you know, splintered into so many different types of comedy and brands of comedy. And, and they're all very, you know, everyone is, is a, uh, guards their own style of comedy and and that that's a little um i would say it's more different on set than it is in the preparation if that makes sense in comedy often there's like you're trying different things or the writers are like pitching different punchlines or different your know, dialogue doesn't seem to be working and they're changing it on the spot so there's a lot more i would say like writer director collaboration in the moment on comedy yeah. than there would be on a drama. I would love to ask how, how is that for you? Because, you know, for example, the only other thing I think we have in common career wise is I shadowed on White Collar. So I got to know Matt Bomer a little bit, who's an yeah. amazing, amazing guy. And your Sinner episodes were stunning. Thank you for making that. Um, but uh, when I was shadowing, we had a bunch of people from 30 Rock come over from the crew because they had just finished, it had just wrapped. And so we got some, the last day or the second to last day of White Collar, we had a bunch of crew like Grips and then whatever assistants come over. And the atmosphere on the set completely changed because the crew were funny. Even the crew from 30 Rock were funny. They were yucking it up yeah. and making jokes and making everyone laugh. So it must yeah. be like a really different experience being on a comedy set than a drama set, just even how everyone interacts. And I would love to hear just about like, how do you, how do you interact with the writers on a comedy set when they go, oh, we want to change this? Do you ever make suggestions? Do you wait to hear from them or the actors? You know, I. I usually will defer to the writer 
you know, I mean, I might, I might have a suggestion when we're planning it, I might have a suggestion about if there's a, if there's a gag or something that's purely visual in nature, like I'll sort of weigh in on that and how to execute that. But when you get to the set, I mean, it's, there's just so many different, it's funny, there's just so many different brands of comedy. Like my favorite, I would say like my favorite and happiest situation is when you're working with people that have a heavy improv background, like Jason Manzukis or a guy named Charlie Sanders I work with, because they're very open. Like just by the nature of how they came up in comedy, they want to hear everyone's idea and they're not, there's a, a lack of kind of severe strictness about it in a way. And like stuff just happens and you put people in front of the camera and they, you know, you just wind them up and let them go. They're so funny. <laughs> but then, you know, there's other, there's other, you know, brands of comedy where the writers are like very proprietary, you know what I mean? And very, they guard their sensibility very carefully. So it, it kind of runs, it, it sort of runs the gamut a little bit, but you know, it's, at the end of the day, if you're a director in television, it's not like being a movie director. You're, you're really deferring mm -hmm. to what the writers, because, you know, the writer is the kind of, they, they're the people that are in charge in television and, and being able to write a lot of episodes of a TV show is like this rare and magical ability, which makes them valuable. Very true, very true. So when you, um, for your first pilot, did you have to pitch on it? Did you have to do like a lookbook and all that? Or how did that come across or come about? Uh, you know, the first pilot, I just got lucky. I sort of fell into it. It was, um, it was Strangers with a Candy. It was Amy Sedaris's pilot. And I think there was an exec at Comedy Central named Belisa Balaban. And she just called, she contacted me about it because she had liked um, some of the Pete, Pete and Pete stuff I did. And mm -hmm. she had sent me a script. And, um, and yeah, so I got into it, got into it that way. So I was, I was lucky, but I understand that the business has changed a lot since I started doing, when I started doing it, it was more of a, just a phone call. If you were, even if you were competing for a job, it would just be a phone call where you'd sort of talk about, you know, how you want to execute it visually and your ideas for casting and maybe you'd break out one scene about how you would treat that scene. But now I understand that it's become a lot more like advertising a little bit, like director will come in for a pilot to audition, you know, pitch their, their ideas to get a pilot and they'll do a whole like lookbook, you know, image polls, like the whole thing. Like, and I was talking to the, execs at MGM who did Bright Handmaid's Tale, which I guess Reed Moreno, that was one of her first big direct, you know, she's this brilliant director. And that was one of her first uh, pilot assignments. And they said that she actually came in like fully loaded, you know, like she was in a different position at that point when she did that pilot. And, and obviously I, she probably has to do a lot less auditioning now, but at that point he said like, it was a full pre presentation with like, you know, image polls and lookbook and all that stuff. So I think, I think the, it's, the business has changed a bit. And then Sarah, you probably talked to you, commercials have even become a lot more like that than they used to be. Yeah, I mean, it, everything is at our fingertips now, which makes it even harder for everyone because you have to produce more and more and more. And, I think that, uh, and it's so competitive. I mean, commercials are uh, incredibly competitive now. Um, I mean, they always have been, but there was always this one little group of people. And I remember when, you know, Liz and I started doing commercials, we were kind of knocking on the door and got in there and then things shifted and changed. I ended up doing a lot of work abroad um, where it went back to the old days where they would just look at your reel and go, okay, do a conference call. Uh, we like her very much. Yes, she can come. Um, you know, and uh, you just go and you shoot. I shot in Moscow and Beirut and different crazy places. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, one thing that I think that I feel that has prepared me a little bit for doing television work is I'm so used to the top down of clients mm. and I'm not coming from features because I think, you know, there is one quite well-known feature director I know who was asked to shadow on a series and she said I'm really insulted that you're asking me to shadow I've done x number of movies 
And, you know, for me, I would bite the hand off if someone said, come and shadow for me, because you get to learn how another director works. I mean, that would be amazing to me because mm -hmm. it's a, a vision into that. But she felt like it was a put down. So it's very interesting because she's coming from the feature world where you're the king or the queen. But in television, you're, you're, there's, there's your writers, then you're, there's your showrunner writers, then you're your number one. Then sometimes there's your DP, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. then you, then we come in and duck yeah. in, right? Yeah, it's you, true. you're like a new kid in class. Mm -hmm. Every time oh. it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but do, do you um and then and I have one question, then we'll, we'll go to the questions here because we have like a million of them. But um, do you because your stuff is so visual, Adam? Do you your prep? Like I was looking at even your 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 pilot for Fargo, your prep on like. Um, when the main character like knocked himself out against the window pain, do you, do you, is this a shot list you do? Is this is something you create on set? Is, you know, where, where are you, how pre-visualized do you become when you're going into, um, you know, visual storytelling oh, scenario? That's a good question. I can, um, you know, I'll do two different things. It's like, I, I did a movie like 20 years ago and I, I storyboarded that whole movie. And I, and, but when I did my first episode of TV, I discovered pretty quickly that there was no time. You, you only you prep seven days for a seven day shoot or seven days for a nine day shoot. So I started doing, um, let me see if I can put this up. Did that go up? Uh, let's see. Did you hear the screen? Oh, yeah. oh look, yeah. look at you. Yeah, Very so nice. I do so like, I'll do something like this. Like, I'll, this is like from the center, from the first episode of last season. Mm -hmm. So I will like go, you know, during my prep week, I'll go to the set and I'll kind of imagine how it would be staged and, you know, what directions I'll be looking in and what directions I won't be looking in. And I'll just do these little notations where I sort of, you know, where I imagine the characters being and maybe what I, what I think the blocking's gonna be and then how many setups. Mm -hmm. And I do this as kind of an exercise, even if it's like a really simple scene that doesn't require that much prep because it, it kind of just gets it in my head. And it also gives me something I can, I can give to, um, I, can, I can give to, you know, the other like the AD or the DP and mm -hmm. say, this is what I have, you know, like that, that's what I have in mind for the scene and they might take advantage of it or they might not, you know, at the very least, I mean, sometimes I do these diagrams and then by the time I, I'm shooting, I can't even understand what I wrote down on the page. <laughs> it's like a mystery right. to me. But I think what it does is it allows at least, you know, for people that, I mean, I have worked, you know, I've worked with like a great DP named Matt Lloyd and he like takes the diagram and then he holds me to it. He like Ooh. puts cameras where they're on the thing and he's like, wait a minute, you said it was five shots, now you're doing six <laughs> shots. So I definitely have people that take them seriously and some ADs will take them seriously to get an idea about how long. But if I have something tricky that's like an action scene or like a montage, then I'll do something a little more, is that up there? Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So then I'll do something like this where I'll do my own kind of primitive, it's like one step up from stick figures, but I'll, I'll kind of draw out the scene you know, of the shots that I know I need for the scene. And then I'll put those on the day, I'll put those up on a, on a board and cross them out. Cause that way you, at least, you know, you're getting your work done. Or like, feels or like good. this big, sorry, it feels good to put the red X. It feels so good, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're making progress. Or even like a scene, like in the scene in the center where like, there was this big car accident. It was shot mm -hmm. over three different days. Some of it was green screen on a stage. Then some of it was like, you know, we were pulling this car in a cable and flipping it over. And yet there was another day on stage where we had like a half car that we were spinning around with all kinds of debris floating around. And so to even just to keep track of what we needed and what had been shot, it was useful to have the storyboards. Yeah, I mean, and that's a, and that was a huge shot, um, setup that whole car scene. 
was huge. I was, you know, for, I was surprised. It was, it felt like a huge, expensive, big movie. It was expensive, I think, yeah. And I think the producers sort of like, because they kept on, we had like a really, um, a Meredith Mills Cavalazzo, our producer is a really smart producer. And she, she took the expense of doing that scene, but because that they were gonna steal that footage and go to that footage throughout the season, she sort of looked at it as like something that goes into the Amort budget. You know, every show has a separate budget for things that are getting used across all the episodes. Like if you build a big set, it will get, it's not, you don't have to charge that set against just one episode. You Mm -hmm. you divide it by 12 or 10 or whatever. And one quick last question, and Sarah and I were talking about the executive producer credit. Right. On Divorce, you had it, and um, on on this last show, you had it. where what is what does that mean besides maybe more cash? Uh, what is that, and and why do you ask for it? Do they just give it to you, or where and is that? Other you know, other responsibilities associated with it. That's a really good question. Often, well, for directors, they'll they'll get EP credits either if you're involved in actually creating the show, you know, you option the material or you develop material, you be an EP, but. Um, Sometimes you'll find like shows want to hire one director for the whole season of the show. And that, and the fact that that makes them some type of a producer because they're on for the whole season. And often uh, if they've been, you know, have a certain number of credits under their belt, they'll end up being called an EP, but that job varies kind of enormously. Like sometimes a show is going to hire a director for the season only because they want them to do a bunch of episodes and they just want to lock them up. Like, Mm -hmm. because TV directors are sort of itinerant, right? They float around, (laughs) you know, from show to show. It's like, you know, they're always trying to like plug them into episodes. But um, so, but the other end of the spectrum is sometimes the director that signs up for the whole season is really boots on the ground solving production. Because sometimes you have a head writer who who doesn't want to they just want to write they don't want to be on set that much Mm -hmm. they don't want to deal with actor issues or tricky technical things or you know if the director the visiting director needs help of some kind they don't you know that's not in there they want someone to do that take the pressure because there's so much pressure writing the show it's so intensely demanding that they want someone to pick up that slack. So sometimes the director slash EP is someone who is wearing all these different hats. They're finishing cuts, they're like scouting locations, they're sort of, there is a backstop for the showrunner, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, uh, yeah, exhausting, yeah, it can be really fun when you're with fun people. (laughs) Well, you get to put your stamp on it. You get to put your, you know what I mean? You're maybe not fo- having to follow someone else's paradigm as much. Like you're, you're creating the paradigm. Um, yeah, I think you might have a little more autonomy. Or if you've directed the first episode, then you have like, you sort of played a role in setting the, the look for the show. Because when you come in to do an episode of a show, your job is just to do the best version of their show. You're not going to reinvent it. You're not going to be like, oh, your show would be so much better if it were handheld, you know. You're just kind of looking at their show saying, all right, this is how they make it. And you try to like, in an efficient way, give them a really good episode. Whereas when you're doing the first, the pilot, then you get to kind of decide like, what's the camera style? What are the sets going to look like? And so you have a little more autonomy. Question from um, the audience here. Um, What, so you've been a producing director, what are the uh, mistakes you see direct TV directors make that I guess get them not asked back would be the follow up. Oh. That. Well, I, I think that, you know, I think it's being, dipl- if you're an episodic director and you're sliding in different shows and Sarah, like you can interrupt me whenever. Um, I want know. to hear from you. <laughs> oh, you want to hear from me. It's, um, it's you got to be super diplomatic because you're a guest, right? on these different shows. You're a guest and really the writer is the person that has like the bigger view on the whole thing. So I think part of it is not to, 
not just to insist on, you know, don't fall on your sword about your ideas. You got to be flexible because you're there to facilitate someone else's vision in a way. So I would say like, uh, listen and stay flexible and don't, don't go to the mat about things. You know what I mean? I think you can express your opinions. You can tell someone why you think something's going to work or not work. But at the end of the day, if they're like, no, that's, I just want this, this is exactly what I want. Then you, you provide that, you know, I think, so I, I've seen that that would be a trap, but I think like maybe directors that come out of features and they're used to having a lot more autonomy might, fall into that situation or they don't understand kind of the uh the process quite as well and then i think i think you know doing your homework and showing up prepared because a lot of the job is you know in commercials you generally have a lot of time and a lot of money to get done what you want to get done and you and you have to listen to a lot of input is uh but in tv you kind of you have the input, but you also have like a tremendous amount of stuff that you're trying to accomplish in a given day, like lots of pages, lots of setups. And it's kind of like this relentless amount of work that you're trying to get done, you know, in a decent amount of time. And I think that the more you show up with a game plan, the better you're going to do at that. And I, I think, you know, I think directors that might show up without having done a lot of homework they could end up doing an amazing episode because they have a lot of talent but if it takes 14 15 hours a day that show is going to be think like god that was expensive or that burned out the crew so you know that that might be something that gets a a, a director sort of not asked back again into director jail yes director um, jail i don't know if it's not like movie jail it's like TV's like you know. <laughs> well, what's the difference? What your the cell is different, different padding. TV jail and movie jail. Well, exactly. I'd say like movie jail is like you do a movie, and if that movie doesn't make any money, or if it's you know if it's, if it's a real dud of a movie, it's over in a weekend, and then you're in movie jail. You don't get to direct another movie for like a number of years till everyone forgets about that other movie. <laughs> Whereas television, you'd really have to kind of do a terrible job many times in a row to to put yourself into tv jail you'd have to kind of blow something <laughs> up on so you know what i mean because you're it's a lot of little jobs it's not one big job um and when you're coming in as a tv director or as you know as a, an episodic director how do you get that relationship with the talent especially the the first couple of numbers on the call sheet how do you get that working for you? Um, that's a great question. I think like the, the person who's like the, the number one on the call sheet sort of sets the tone for what it's like on set. So if they're like warm and funny and nice, then that kind of infuses the whole thing. Or if they're, if they're, you know, not so nice, then everyone's kind of walking on eggshells. So you generally kind of, you kind of just try to get some intelligence on you know when you're in prep it's usually the assistant director will kind of say to the director like you know and you'll say like look they don't want you they don't want to be blocked you know let them you know they they have a certain process they really want to feel like they're finding the scene so don't go in there right away and sort of tell them exactly what's you know or they might say look they this person's been on the show for like 10 years and she loves to be directed she really feels that you know to keep it interesting for her she wants she really wants the directors to kind of challenge her and give her notes and stuff like that so it, it just it's, it's really specific to the situation and usually like the producers like in prep there's usually something called like a, a concept meeting and then there's something called a tone meeting concept meeting is mostly about logistics and involves all the department heads but the tone meeting involves specifically like the script and also the different actors and often the producer the either the head writer or one of the producers the ad they'll give you the skinny on all the different actors like this person like is great on two takes they don't like to do more than two takes this person needs to warm up a lot you know so make sure you give them a lot of takes you know let them find you know so it's it's you're sort of adjusting yourself to the actor and to the type of actor that you have 
and, and you're getting the preemptive on the land on the landmines that are about to be laid out around you as you're right. So you don't right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell you where the mines are placed. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good idea. Um, so in our questions, one of the, if someone wants to know where you guys went to university and what did you study there? I'll Sorry, go first. Yes, yeah. give Adam a break. I, want, I really just want to hear from Adam, but uh -huh. um, I went to, um, I started as a painter, went to Chelsea and I was a painter for a while and then it wasn't gelling for me and then I discovered film and went, oh, hello, and um, oh, went to, uh, went to uh, St. Martin's, but it was an experimental film school. So when I arrived in New York in 86, when Adam was in um, his music video days, I ended up working at a company called Broadcast Arts, and that was a great, that was really my school. That's where I really learned. I remember I worked BA. there too. Did you? Yeah. What did, what did you work on there? I worked for this director named George Engelbrecht. I know George Engelbrecht. He yeah. used to do these pontalistic paintings. Yeah, he, he was, a, he was a doing animated, I was like his assistant. Wow. Broadcast Arts was a real, kind of sweatshop wasn't it it was like it was crazy <laughs> but it was a school in a way yeah Where did it was you a cool floor through of the whole thing because i went visit i had different friends i visited there a lot and i remember maybe shooting something they had little stages all over the place and yeah. you could do like little insert shoots and and every doorway it was like every closet was filled with all this weird arty like you know make paper mache animal things with you know glitter basically yeah yeah, it was a wild place. It's very, yeah, and I'm glad we all experienced that because that was so New York at the time too. Very New York. So we have, um, um, Oh, but where did Adam go to film school? Oh, I'm sorry, Adam, yes. Where did, did I, you go to film you know, school? I was always like a movie obsessed as a kid in high school. I would see a ton of movies and I would like write my own little reviews of movies and read about directors. But I ended up going to a liberal arts school that didn't offer any filmmaking at all. Like they just had some film, you know, they had like very, you know, a lot of the academic institutions, like they don't want to teach practical filmmaking because they see it as a vocation. And so everything is always couched in these very kind of different academic disciplines. So the filmmaking was taught by like a comp lit professor. It was hard to kind of learn much about film. So I ended up just getting summer jobs. I think specifically it was maybe like my junior year. Like I just worked, you know, I was in New York working for some filmmakers. So it was sort of my point of entry was more through the summer job than through um, anything I studied in school. That would be my advice. If you're a kid out there even if you're at the new york film academy studying with liz go and work also you have a different experience and it's great exactly yeah you have an think, mm -hmm. and yeah it's think, good Adam? to do, do both oh go ahead i'm sorry no you go because um, um this is our last this is our last pitch we're on the we're on the last minute so on that note advice to the just, it's not even the young filmmaker, people that, you know, want to have a prolific, expanded career like you do, Adam, and you do, Sarah, where, how do, how do we do this? Uh, well, I mean, I sort of, my advice, like, when I talk about, like, I had a very zigzaggy, like, I didn't get anywhere very directly with what I was doing. It, it was all, you know, the only person that's had a perfectly straight career to the top is David Fincher. Everyone else has had to struggle, <laughs> but it's, I, I, I think that you just take your opportunities where you find them. You always work as hard as you can. You always do your best job. And if people think well of you and they remember you fondly, then that is going to lead to something else. The fact that you did your, your very best job and you never, you just never know where something's going to take you. You just kind of grab your opportunities as they, Present that, and even if I find if I've been on a job that I didn't like, it, you know, there's always someone I meet on that job that I'm happy I met them, and then I get to work with them again. Totally. You guys. And, <laughs> and you, Sarah? What would I be just, your... I just ditto to everything Adam said. Show up, be polite, 
I say this, I was raised by wolves. It took me a while to figure this out, but say thank you to everyone. I write thank you letters still. Be a mensch, be a good person, work hard. Really brilliant. Um, and last thing, Adam, so who, it's, since this is the Creative Visionary series and I'm the one that's reaching out to all these Creative Visionaries like you guys, who else, who would you suggest I reach out to? Who would you like I to have keep talk to? Like in the, on the TV end or in the commercial I mean, end or the music video like end? Whatever or? comes to you end. I mean, I reached out to a really big publicist this week, Madonna's publicist, because I was like, that sounds like an interesting lady. Yeah, yeah. I got to, I'm going to give that some thought and I'm going to put it in a, in a special email to you, but I'll, Perfect. I should think about that. Yeah. That'd be great. I would love that. And Sarah and I always talk and she always has amazing suggestions. Like Sarah's the one that, you know, suggested you. So thank you guys. Oh, so I'm glad much. you did. It's a lot of fun. Like yeah. the most amazing time. I've, I've learned so much. So thank you 2020 audience. And we will see you next week with Joe Berlinger, the, the iconic documentary director. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> nice to see you both. Bye, you too. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.